as I was looking at this message, since it fits in like part of our Sunday morning series, I thought about giving it a title that would make it match. But I'm going to be honest. I'm just going to call this message saying no to the divorce. We're going to discuss what the Bible teaches about it. Uh, and we're going to discuss another issue along the way. Matthew chapter number 5, uh, verse number 27. It says, Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you that whosoever uh, looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. <coughs> and if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee, for it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. And if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off and cast it from thee, for it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. It hath been said, Whosoever shall put away his wife, let him give her a writing of divorcement. But I say unto you that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, causeth her to commit adultery, and whosoever shall marry her that is divorced committeth adultery. Now, when we look at this passage, to be honest, there's two ways I could preach this. We can preach it in the order that it's discussed, or I can take my mess, my outline and preach it backwards. And even standing here right now, I'm still not sure what is the better way for me to do this. Because he begins by dealing with what is usually the cause of divorce. And biblically speaking, is the only real cause. I mean by that the only biblically acceptable. Now, the other side of that, though, is he then goes on to discuss what the Bible teaches about divorce. So, the way he's doing this is he's getting the preventative maintenance out of the way first. He's giving you the advice to try to keep you from ever getting to the problem in the first place. Uh, and then he begins to discuss what the laws are concerned. Uh, and so I like to typically preach the way the passage is written. Uh, but in this particular case, I feel like we're going to discuss what the Bible says about divorce first. And then we will come back and get the verses to try to help prevent us from getting there. That's why I said, I'm not sure it's the best way. Uh, but we're going to preach my outline backwards. Now. 
Because God does have a lot to say about the world. I mean, you understand, He actually gives a specific law in the Old Testament. Now, God did not create divorce. But He did tell them, if it's going to happen, this is how it has to go. Now, that's sometimes the misunderstanding we get when we read the Old Testament. Like when we read verses about... Uh, Uh, slavery. Sometimes we get the idea that God created or approved of it. Uh, but in truth, what God did was to put regulations on something man created to ensure that a certain group of people were treated like people and not property. Uh, and there's many examples I can give like that. With divorce, God does the same thing. It's not something He approves of. It's not His creation. But if people are going to do it, He's going to regulate it to make sure Uh, that it's done in the best way it possibly can be. So, just to give you some verses for understanding, he tells us here in verse 31 and 32, he says, It hath been said, Whosoever shall put away his wife, let him give her a writing of divorcement. Now, this is explored deeper in Matthew 19. We'll go there in a minute. But of course, if you understand what he's referring to, you have passages like Deuteronomy 24, where he explains to you what his law for divorce was. And that's that if a man and a woman get married, and he finds that he's going to put her out, that they just can't continue the marriage. God says for him to give her a writing of divorcement. And he explains that if that woman were to go and marry another man, uh, and that man was to die, or if that man was to divorce her, that the first husband could never take her back. Once she had been married uh, to somebody else. Now, I believe the reason for this uh, is because marriage is very serious to God. And He wants us not to play with it. If I can give an example of this, uh, I have someone that's a relative of mine that I think she's on her fourth marriage uh, to the third man because she married the first one divorced him married the second one the third one and then went back to the first one. now God actually says it's an abomination they laughed about It and made jokes and treat like it's not a big deal. <coughs> But God does say that's an abomination. Now you may have deeper, more insightful reasons. Uh, but for me, I say simply it's this. Marriage is serious to God and it's not to be treated like a game. Now, there's more laws than that. But that's the basics of what the law teaches. Uh, and so when you go into this, and Jesus says you've heard before, this is what he's talking about. You know, you know that the law says this. Uh, but if you really want to see the heart of God, 
There's two things you really have to look at. One thing he says here. And that's the, the only cause that or the only exception that he allows for. Where divorce does not lead into adultery. Is when the divorce is because of adultery. Now I'll go to Matthew 19 because he explains it again a little more there. This passage gives it more from the woman's perspective. Matthew 19 gives it more from the man. Uh, but when we look at this, uh, the other side of what we have to consider, we'll find when we go to the beginning of Matthew 19. And that's where he tells you God's heart concerning marriage and divorce. So Matthew 19 verse 1 says, And it came to pass that when Jesus had finished these sayings, he departed from Galilee and came into the coast of Judea beyond Jordan. And great multitudes followed him, and he healed them there. Uh, the Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him, and saying unto him, Is it lawful uh, for a man to put away his wife for every cause? And he answered and said unto them, Have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female and said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother uh, and shall uh, cleave to his wife? Uh, and they twain shall be one flesh. Wherefore they are no more twain but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let no man put asunder. In this passage, he tells you what God's feelings about it are. Now his answer to the next question tells you what's legally required. But his answer here tells you what he feels about it. Because they're asking, can a man divorce his wife for whatever reason he wants? And he tells them, didn't you read your Bible? Yeah. Didn't God already say that what therefore God hath joined together let no man put a son. Didn't God already command uh, that when a man and a wife join in marriage that they become one flesh? See, what he's explaining is that the real answer to the question the answer to the question of whether divorce is right or not is that while there is a legal answer to that the real answer is what is marriage actually about in the first place and that's when God joins two people in marriage when those two people come before God and make a vow that, that vow is to be very serious. So serious that he says those two people are joined together as one person. So that it's no longer Lori versus Junior uh, and that her benefit goes somehow against my benefit but that we're one person. Her successes are my successes. No, we cannot be successful apart in The fact is, if her success requires that it's apart from me, 
then in the more important things, we're actually failing. Because if we're not succeeding together, then we're failing apart. He explains that when, when two people are married, that they are to leave father and mother, that all other earthly connections become insignificant in comparison. That if you're having some kind of problem between a husband and a wife, then your mama and daddy's opinion does not matter. And they are sinning against God if they try to get in the middle of it. Because your closest connection on earth is not even your children. It is your spouse. Uh, because that's the way that God makes marriage. That's what marriage is to be. It is to be two people becoming one person. Now, that connection is one of all of you. Body, soul, and spirit. That's why we should save ourselves for marriage. It's more than that. But that's one of many reasons. Uh, that everything you save for marriage, you know, every kiss, every touch, all of those things, God designed them uh, to form a bond physically between a man and wife. When you enjoy them outside of marriage, you are in sin. And you're giving or taking something that God did not give you the ability, the authority to do. Uh, you are cheapening something that God designed for the purpose of making that physical bond between a husband and wife. You know, if you're being sewed together in three parts, you know, body, soul, and spirit, uh, then you've already weakened the thread on the body side. Emotionally speaking, uh, we also become so together. I think that's part of why in Deuteronomy, in the same passage where he gives the, the law for divorce, in the very next verse, he explains that when a man and wife get married, that for the first year, that man is not allowed to go off to war. He needs to lay aside his business adventures. And he needs to stay home with his wife. Because in that time, you are emotionally and I would say even spiritually being knitted together. But here's an example of even what I mean in that. Just as much as you are cheapening the intimacy of the physical side of marriage, when you give things before marriage, whether it be to your future spouse or somebody else, you also are cheapening and hurting your marriage when you give your heart. Because that's something that should be reserved for the person you're going to marry. You shouldn't be entering into a marriage with all these past heartbreaks and all these other people attached to it. 
That's why true wisdom and the way that Christians should behave in this is to keep our hearts uh, and not invest our hearts until we are sure that the relationship is God's. Uh, because so much of what you're doing when you take all of these things that God designed is you are already sabotaging and cheapening a marriage. You're playing with things that you probably don't even begin to understand. And you're taking something that's supposed to be special, the, the most sacred bond on the earth, and you're already chipping away, you're hammering away at the foundation of it. Before you ever even got into the marriage. So these things have to be taken seriously. But his answer in this, again, is that two people who, again, are unique and different, that in marriage, he unites them as one person. He knits them together physically, emotionally, and spiritually. That's why it's important that a believer be not unevenly yoked with an unbeliever. It's probably not fair for me to make this comparison. But it's a lot like what Jesus talked about when he said not to sew an old garment and a new garment together. Two different types of garment. I mean. Uh, it's the same idea. You're creating the same consequences. So the first answer you have to understand before you can understand anything about divorce is you have to understand marriage. That it's sacred to God. That while, yes, we're going to see there is allowance for it. What does God really say His opinion of it is? He says, I believe it's in Hosea 2. I'm going to guess verse 16. Uh, he says that He hates putting away. That means he hates divorce. That is a term for divorce. It's putting away. And he says he hates that. So you want to talk about some things God hates. He may allow for divorce, but he does hate it. Because when he created marriage, he created it to be till death through his part. When he created it, he created it to be two people people becoming one person. And he said, let nobody put that asunder. You know, let nobody do surgery and separate them. So you have to understand the heart of what God really feels about it if you really want to see it from God's side. Before you can ever take and look at just what the law says, you need to look at what God feels about it first. Then picking up in Matthew 19 verse 7, they say unto him, Why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement and to put her away? He saith unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, suffered you to put away your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. And I say unto you, Whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery, and whosoever marrieth her which is put away, doth commit adultery. Now what he's saying is this, is that 
when the question is asked, <coughs> okay, if that's how God really feels about marriage, <coughs> then why did Moses allow for it? <coughs> you know, why is there an allowance for it in the law? <coughs> that's why they're talking about Moses, because of the law. <coughs> But we know <coughs> Moses wrote underneath the, the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. <coughs> so what they're really asking <coughs> is if God feels so strongly about divorce then why did he allow for it in his law? And the answer he says is this it wasn't designed that way from the beginning from the beginning he made him male and female and designed that when two come together they become one flesh but because of the hardness of our hearts he allowed for divorce well, what does that mean? It means when God looked on his creation, he saw in us that there are some things we won't forgive. There are some places where we just won't move. And he said because of that, in one cause, I will allow for divorce. That's in the cause of fornication. Now, if you have a Bible that says something besides fornication, or whatever the proper Romanian translation of that is, I won't pick on you guys. Uh, but if you have a Bible in English that says something else, because all of them except for the King James do, then your Bible is a lie. Because the word is not sexual immorality. Sexual immorality is a matter of opinion. It means whatever you think is sexually inappropriate. Fornication has a clear definition. That is any sex taking place between two people who are not married to each other. Now, that includes adultery. Because adultery is when somebody who is married has sex with someone they're not married to. But that also would include uh, sex before marriage. Now, what he's discussing here would seem to be clearly adultery. Now, you can argue what all that means concerning the letter of the law that he says fornication. Now, for me, this is what I would take. If you marry a girl and you find out that before you were married she was cheating on you with other men then God is saying that's just like adultery you know, if only if while you're over here celebrating for the wedding tomorrow you know she's cheating with somebody else then he's treating that as a cause the same way as if she cheated after the marriage because you do have to make something of the fact that he says fornication and not adultery because adultery only means when it happens after you're already married and God doesn't make mistakes you know he's not dumb to forget what the word meant he 
specifically chose the word he meant to use. So I'll let you come to what you think that means. For me, though, with the understanding of the passage, the obvious answer would be that. That he's saying, if you found out that this woman you're engaged to, you're a spouse to her, uh, that she's been cheating and all these things before the marriage that God's treating that as adultery like it didn't happen after the marriage. If you have a better answer, I'll hear it. Uh, if you don't like my answer, you're welcome to go with whatever you want. But you have to have one. Because God does use the word fornication and not adultery. But what he's teaching is this. He says, except for in the cause of fornication. If you get a divorce, when you remarry, it is adultery. So according to God, the exception, the, the place where he says, okay, you can divorce, and this person can remarry is when your spouse has committed adultery or fornication so even that shows you though what the one thing that God says this is where some people can't forgive that there's some things that the human heart just can't move past that uh, and that would be in the case of adultery now that doesn't mean that every marriage will end because of that it's the exception, it's not the rule. He's not telling you to divorce because you were cheated on. He says it's the one place where you can and can still remarry. The thing that determines whether that happens or not are the two people involved. He says it's because the hardness of your heart. So I would challenge you with this. We know one obvious application that some men can't forgive once that's happened to them. Some women can't forgive once that's happened. Because between these two passages, he gives it from both perspectives. But I would challenge you to consider another possible side of that. And that's the hardness of the person who cheated hard. Because I've not noticed in either passage where he specifies it's one or the other. That another factor in causing this is when that other person refuses to turn and repent. Now it still comes back to the person who was cheating. That's still the root, I mean, the, the main, the thing that determines. But I do believe one thing that he's allowing as a factor when he says that I allowed for this in my law because of the hardness of heart is that one reason why some men can't just forgive and move on is not just that they can't forgive the adultery but that the adulterer is too hard hearted to repent and that's the reason why they can't move on I would say you have to at least consider that that's possibly the other side of what he's saying I'm not saying it's one or the other I think that both of those are things he's talking about 
But then he goes on into verse 10. His disciples say unto him, If the case, if if the case of the man be so with his wife, it is not good to marry. But he said unto them, All men cannot receive this saying, save they to whom it is given. For there are some uh, eunuchs which were so born from their mother's womb, and there are some eunuchs which were made of man, and there are some eunuchs which have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. He that is able to receive it, let him receive it. What is happening here is his disciples are saying. You know, if that's really the truth, you know, if God wants us to still try to save a marriage even after uh, adultery and all of this, and the only cause where he allows for divorce and remarriage is adultery, I have to remember what I said to repeat. I'm not supposed to get uh, If the only cause where he allows for divorce and remarriage is adultery, uh, then they say it's better off we didn't get married. It's just too much. Uh, and so he tells them. I'm going to simplify because he says something quite complicated. He says marriage is not for everybody. But for those it's for, this is God's rules. And essentially what he's saying is this. A eunuch is someone who's been castrated so they can't reproduce. In terms of someone who's been made a eunuch by men. Now, when he talks about somebody being a eunuch for God's kingdom's sake, I think the obvious answer to that would be he's talking about people who've chosen not to marry so they can devote all their time to God. Someone who's a eunuch from birth could mean someone that has a defect that they can't reproduce. And therefore don't have a lot of those same drawings or lust, let's say. Uh, it could also mean someone who just doesn't naturally have that lust. I'll let you debate that side. But what he is saying is that there's some people in this world that marriage is not for them. Not everybody's going to get married. You know, whether it be because they just can't do it, they don't desire it, or they've been set aside for something else. Not everybody's going to do it. But if you're going to do it, this is God's standard. That first you need to understand what He joins together, no man should put asunder. But if it's going to happen, the only exception is in the, ca the case of fornication. It's when there has been some form of adultery. Uh, that's the exception. Now, there are verses you should consider. For sake of time, I'm not going to say much about 1 Corinthians 7. You do have it in front of you, though. So take it and read it. I'll give you a short interpretation of it. And that's what Paul is saying this. That... If you get divorced, and it's not for this cause, then don't remarry. Uh, because he teaches that in any other case it would be adultery. 
Uh, in fact, there's laws specifically explaining that the adulterer, if they were to remarry, would be an adulterer. Uh, and so there's laws for explaining that stuff. Now, the other thing he says there is that if you are a believer and you have a spouse who is an unbeliever, don't leave them. Stay with them uh, because you as a believer not only have made a commitment to them, but you have an opportunity to stay there and be a witness to win them to Christ. Now that's for if you're already married. There's a clear Bible teaching for if you're not married. And that's not to be unevenly yoked with an unbeliever. But if you're married, he says if they're willing to stay with you, you stay with them. He does explain though that if they choose to leave, you can't make them stay. I think I can illustrate this. I want to be careful because I care about the person who I'm going to use as an example. And I would never want to hurt them. Uh, but there is someone who is a friend of mine that their spouse left them. Her. Uh, and cheated on her with another woman. Uh, and told them, told her repeatedly, I do not love you. He filed for divorce. And for years, she refused to give the divorce. Because she was willing to forgive the adultery and move on. And she believed in reconciliation and wanted to reconcile. But Paul actually says something about this in this verse. He actually talks about the fact that in that situation, he refers to you as being not a slave to them, not in bondage to them. Then in a situation where they've tried to move on with their life and forget you, în situații în care ei încearcă să continuă cu viața lor și să te uite. That you're not in bondage today. Tu nu mai ești în legătură cu ei. You know, of course you want it to be a witness. Cu siguranță tu vrei să fii o mărturie. You know, you, you see God's heart for marriage, so you want it to save. Tu vrei, vezi inima lui Dumnezeu pentru că stări și vrei ca să salvezi. But you can't make those decisions for somebody else. Dar tu nu poți să faci aceste decizii pentru altcineva. You can't force them to come back and get things right. Nu poți să-i forțezi să vină înapoi și să facă lucrurile drepte. And I believe that's exactly exactly what he's talking about in that passage. Is that if they choose that they're leaving, you cannot make them stay. So going back to Matthew chapter 5, I said there was a whole other side of this that we can call preventative maintenance. You're trying to stop it from happening. And that's what he began with. That's why I regretted having to go backwards. Uh, but in order for you to take this part seriously, I felt like I needed to deal with God's stance on marriage and divorce first. So let's go back and read Matthew 5.27. You have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. He's referring to the Ten Commandments. Uh, but I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. What he's teaching here is this. 
that if adultery is the one exception, it's also the one real cause. But it's not always that it comes to a point of actually committing the physical act of adultery. Because you commit adultery in your heart long before you ever do it physically. He says, when a man looks on a woman and he begins to lust after her in his flesh, that in his heart he's already committed adultery. Now, that doesn't, you can't use that as a constitution for divorce. But there is a difference between committing it in your heart and committing it literally and physically. The, the idea is like this. The Bible says Abraham offered up Isaac. Did he physically do that? Did he take his son and stab him with a knife on Mount Moriah? No. So the consequences of stabbing your son with a knife did not apply. Now, his son didn't die. But, in his heart, he had already sacrificed his son. That's why he set out on the journey. In his heart, he had already committed to do that. It was already given to God. The reason why people fall into adultery physically is because they've already committed to it in their heart. And it doesn't happen overnight. You get that way little by little. In fact, I would dare say this. Just like idolatry begins long before you start bowing, bowing down to statues, adultery begins long before you go and sleep with someone else. In your heart, you're already committing adultery when you start caring about other people or other things more than your spouse. What happens is that so often you make a connection with someone. You start to have feelings for them that you have no right to feel. Thoughts that are evil And in your heart, you've already committed the act. That's why you begin trying to make it come to pass physically. When a man commits adultery with a woman, he's already decided in his heart to try to draw her into that long before they ever go to the bed. See, adultery begins way back there. When you start letting things come in between your marriage that should not be there, you've already started. And I'm saying things because it's not just people. And when you start letting other things come between you and your spouse that should not be there, you already begin to attack and destroy your marriage so that all you're waiting for is the open door and the invitation. You already put yourself on that path. That's why adultery begins in the heart. In fact, if there's one thing you should already be taking away from Matthew 5, it's that our problems are heart problems. That's what we've seen in each of these passages. So what he says is this. 
If you're going to say no to divorce, Dacă vei spune nu divorțului, then yeah, you have to see what we saw a minute ago. You have to see it from God's perspective. But, Dar, for, if you're not already there, Dacă tu nu ești deja acolo, if you're not already at the point where you have to debate the legal side of it, if the adultery legal, hasn't already happened, nu deja, then the way to say no is to start now in shutting the door so that you don't get there by not allowing for the place of temptation. That's why he gives the example. He says, if your eye offends you, to pluck it out. If your hand offends you, to cut it off. What he says in this is that He's using the example of your salvation. That if this is the thing that's keeping you from trusting in Christ, if this is the thing that's going to cause you to go to hell, and get rid of it, it'd be better to have one less eye and know you're going to heaven. It'd be better to have one less hand and know you're going to heaven. But applying this back to marriage, there's a simple thing here. If your marriage is that serious to you that you don't want to lose it, then if there's something that's causing the problem, If it be that there's someone that you're already feeling attracted to, cut that off. Cut it off and get rid of it. You'd be better off to have one less friend than to lose your marriage. If there's something that you're doing, that you know is causing problems between you and your spouse, then get rid of it. If you have to change jobs to save it, then get rid of that job. It's worth a pay cut. It's worth living in poverty to not break the marriage. If you take it even remotely as serious as God does, then any sin, any temptation, any hindrance that is starting you on the path that will break your marriage, cut it off now. Don't wait until you destroy it. For those of you who are not married, I gave you some things that are hindering your marriage already. Dating, giving your heart to people, touching, kissing, any of that kind of stuff that God designed for you to save for your spouse cut it off now because if not you're going into a marriage with the footsteps for adultery already there so I don't care how fun it may feel Cut it off. That's the thing you have to do. You want to protect your marriage, start protecting it now. Don't wait until you have to debate, well, who committed adultery and who didn't. Don't wait until you have to debate, is this forgivable or not. Don't let yourself get into the situation that some people have. Where you have to decide, can I still live with this person? And start taking your marriage as serious as God does now. So that you can protect it now.
Ca tu să poți să o protejezi acum. Let me give you one passage. Să vă dau un, un pasaj. Because he talks about in he talks about here cutting it off. Uh, So I want to give you a passage that talks about some things you should cut off. Colossians 3.5 says, Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Now understand, God's very specific in the way He chooses words. So there's no mistake when He says, let no man cut the marriage asunder. You know, that's saying to amputate or cut off. There's no mistake that He's telling you if the eye or the hand is a problem, pluck it out, cut it off. Nu uh, este nicio greșeală să spun dacă ochiul sau mâna vă duce în putină, vă putină și să le tăiați. And he didn't accidentally say mortify, which is to amputate. Și nu mod uh, accidental spune să le mod modificați. So, care este cuvântul să le amputați? Here in this passage. Aici în pasajul acesta. Because they do connect. Because of connect, uh, se face uh, legătura. These things he tells you to cut off. Aceste lucruri care vă spune să le tăiați. If you look, a lot of this is what leads to adultery. Dacă vă uitați la aceste lucruri, multe dintre ele conduce spre adulter. I mean, you think about what he says here. Gândiți-vă ce spune aici. I mean, the first thing on his list. Primul lucru pe listă este. When he tells us to cut off fornication, that is adultery. That is, I mean, any sex that you're having with someone you're not married to. So if you're not married to anybody yet, that's you cheating on the spouse you don't even have yet. Because that was to be saved for marriage. God designed it that way. He said anything less is sin. Spune că orice care este mai puțin este păcat. If you're married, obviously it's adultery. Dacă ești căsătorit, cu siguranță este adulte. That's pretty easy thing to cut off. Este foarte uh, un lucru foarte ușor să tai. Uncleanness. Necurăție. Uh, would be touching those things that God says are unclean. Este să atingi acest lucru care spune Dumnezeu că sunt necurate. It's participating in touching things God tells you not to mess with. Este să participi în a atinge lucruri care Dumnezeu spune să nu te încurci cu ele. So you want a good first step on the path to uh, to divorce? Vrei un, uh, un, uh, Or let's just say to adulter. Un, uh, pas bun Then let sin. Lasă you know, let those things that God tells you don't touch this. It's filthy. Let those stay. Lasă să Keep messing with them. Because you're very quickly on your way to adultery. You know, keep going to the websites he says don't go to. Keep looking at the things he tells you not to look at. Keep going and hanging out at the places where you know temptation is. He told you not to be there. Because you're already on your way to family. Inordinate affection would be having affection or cares for something that are not lawful. I'm a married man. If I have care for any woman, like what God has designed for me to have for my wife, that is unlawful. I am sinning against the law of God because I'm not to have that kind of affection for anyone but my wife. That affection is special. And if you're a man, that you have that kind of affection for someone that you're not married to and you're not engaged getting ready to go for the wedding it's in order you have no legal right to feel that way about that person evil concupiscence are 
Concupiscence is sexual lust, sexual desires. Uh, este, um, By nature, those things are not evil. Prin natura lor, nu sunt rele. That's why God said the marriage bed is undefiled. Spune că patrul, uh, este Again, eliminat. God created that to help bind a man and wife together physically. They're evil when you feel those kind of temptations about somebody else. In any way that can be counted as adult. And then there's covenants. Well, covenants, he defines what it means here. He says it's idolatry. So, covenants is when we care about anything more than we do God. So, I can preach a whole message on how that's going to destroy your marriage. But let me give you a thought. What's the Ten Commandments? What is the Tenth Commandment? Not to covet your neighbor's wife or his house. Now, the idea is that Well, what is God's specific example? Your neighbor's wife. He is telling you that you need to cut this off. If you're looking at somebody else's wife, And you say, man, I wish I had a wife like that. And, I mean, what you're doing is you're creating a lust in your heart. Well, you're married or unmarried, you're already committing a sin. But for a married man, you're already into adultery. In your heart, you're there. Because you're exalting someone else's wife above yours. So he's telling you to cut these things off now. You know, don't let these feelings stir inside of you. If, if as a man, if there's a woman in your life that you can tell in yourself already that you're having sexual desires toward her and you're not married to her, then get away from her. Stop spending time around her. Put some distance between you. Now, I'm talking to people in church. So I understand you may not be able to avoid that person altogether. But if you're married, for the sake of your marriage, get some distance. Cut off that friendship. If you're one day hoping to be married, then cut that off. Because you have no right to be feeling those things right now. Now I understand some of that's natural, but it's evil when you don't have the right to feel. If you as a husband or wife, I've picked on the men, so let me say this about the women. If any of the ladies, there's a man in your life that he's not your husband, but you feel a connection to him, a care for him, that in any way compares to the one for your husband. That is an inordinate affection. You have no legal right to feel that. Way. Cut that off. Don't spend time around that person. Because you're opening your heart up to adultery. You need to shut that door. Any of these things. I mean, obviously, fornication goes without saying. But any of these things. Allowing sin to just be comfortable in your life. Allowing for yourself to feel the way about another man the way you would about your husband. Uh, 
letting sexual attraction grow or just coveting just looking and saying man I wish I had a wife like that cut it all off now because if not you've already set yourself up that you're committing adultery in your heart so the first thing any of you should be doing is cutting off those things that are going to get in the way of a marriage. Married or not, you should already be doing that. You should be taking precautions to make your marriage good before you ever get there. Now, if you've got to this point already, now, if adultery has already happened, then God explains it to you that in His desire for marriage, you should try to fix it. But He understands there are some things that just cannot be moved past. And in those cases, the one who was cheated on, you have the right. You can divorce and you can remarry. There are some things that disqualify you. You know, as a man who will never be qualified to be a preacher, you can't be a deacon anymore. But you can still remarry, you can move on with your life, you can still serve God. The door to serving God is not shut. There are just a couple things that are shut. But you're not broken and defective or whatever you want to call it. There's still, you can move on and serve God. Legally speaking, you're allowed that. The question you always should ask yourself, though, is just because I'm allowed to do it, is it really what I should do? And that's where we really have to take God's desire for marriage into consideration. So, what I say to you tonight is this. God has specific standards, specific rules. He explains them in His Word. For everybody here tonight, you're in one of these places. You either need to be preparing for marriage and taking these things serious now. You need to be protecting the marriage you have. Or for some, you're in a situation where you have to decide if you want to salvage or save a marriage. And you have to look at your situation. I can't give you a blanket answer for that. Because when God told you the cause was the hardness of the heart, that means also that the choice is individual. All I can give you is what God teaches about the rules. But